the nature designed everything almost perfectly. The, just the amount necessarily needed to produce the chemical transmission between the, across the nerve and muscle. So too much of acetylcholine uh, can produce what we call cholinergic crisis uh, because uh, uh, it, 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 it chronic too much of, uh, 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 of uh, um, mesinone um, sometimes can cause uh, muscle problem in itself. But during acute phase, it can lead into a crisis that can also require um, mechanical me ventilation. So sometimes the, the, the symptoms are very similar. You can have excessive secretions. You can have, you know, uh, heart rate. The way that we usually check if the heart rate becomes too low, uh, we say, oh, maybe that's due to too much of the, uh, uh, of the uh, mastinone. So one has to be careful because the tendency when the myasthenia get started to get worse, patient will start self-medication. I'm going to take more and see whether I can get better. Uh, but there should, they should know that when you have to keep taking more, it means to say your immune system is acting up, that it may not be enough. You cannot just keep taking more and more because you can push yourself into cholinergic crisis. So basically, your, if you have too much acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction, basically your nerve keeps firing, firing, firing. It does never shut down. So that can lead to muscle weakness and even lead to um, a myasthenic crisis. Dr. Sullivan, do you have a typical dose that you want patients to watch out for as far as how much acetylcholine is too Well, each patient is different. Some patients yeah. can tolerate higher dose than others. So you cannot just say, oh, the maximum is this dose. But, but you, based on the symptoms, you know, we base in where the patients start complaining a lot. If you have a lot of diarrhea, a lot of cramps, you start getting a, muscle, a lot of muscle twitching, and instead of making your myasthenia better, you start getting more secretions. That, those are maybe signs that you're taking too much of the mesinone. Incontinence is not a commonly described symptom in myasthenia, but there are reports in the medical literature of patients uh, with myasthenia and have urinary incontinence in what we call atonic bladders. The bladder doesn't contract. Um, as far as the exact etiology, because the receptors in the bladder muscles are different from the receptors that act in the skeletal muscles, muscles within limb and breathing muscles. So as far as I know, the exact etiology, why my, these patients will have urinary incontinence, we, we're not clear, but it is a described uh, it has been described in patients, and uh, in those case reports, that it, these symptoms do improve with treatment of myasthenia. So, so, so even though the chemical is the same, it's acetylcholine, but the receptors are different. So presumably, if we take a lot of too much mastinone, sometimes patients will notice that mm -hmm. they have urinary frequency. Okay, they have to go frequently. Uh, so sometimes it's the opposite instead of, uh, uh, it's urinary incontinence from, from not being able to get there soon enough because they have uh, uh, frequent urination, okay? Uh, so, so it's like having diarrhea as the side effects of the uh, too much mastinone. Unfortunately, there's not a, not a lot of studies, good studies to look at the effect of exercise in myasthenia. Um, but what I would recommend to patients is that they usually, first of all, your myasthenia has to be stable to, to undergo an exercise program. And then the exercise that, you, the type of exercise you do should be uh, low impact exercise, things like uh, a stationary bike or elliptical instead of you know running for miles and miles. Um, another rule of thumb is that you should uh, you know, listen to your body. If you do a type of exercise for a few certain period of time and you find you, there's a lot of muscle soreness, cramp, um, trouble breathing, that probably you should stay away from that type of exercise or the, the length of duration for that exercise. So listen to your body. Um, res type of exercise such as resistance training, stretching exercises, um, and uh, such as stationary bike or elliptical are the good ones to start. And aquatic exercise in the water would be good ones to start with. 
So, so the one thing I tell my patients as far as exercise is where they can do weights with dumbbells. I don't want them to be lifting weights while they're lying down because they get arms get fatigued. They can get into trouble. And although some patients, uh, I have one patient with a policeman who's very stubborn and still wanted to do that. Uh, but you can imagine if your arms get tired, then the whole thing can come into a, your windpipe, right? So uh, I agree that low impact exercise will be better. To inactivated toxins, uh, inactivated uh, virus, totally dead, inactivated, those are okay. It's just the live ones that you cannot have. Uh, now, if you're myasthenia, if you're in remission, you're, you're not taking any immunosuppressants, then you could, okay? So although the, there's always some slight risk in saying, well, maybe, maybe since, you know, the whole of, the goal of the vaccine is to stimulate your, your immune system to produce antibodies, right? So some patients are always worried, well, will it stimulate it to produce more antibodies for myasthenia also? So that's why we, we usually tell them, make sure your myasthenia is relatively stable before you start taking these vaccines. Yeah, the CDC has a really good information. It has a printed out information on all, all kinds of vaccines that it also, usually it tells you which patient should receive this type of vaccine and which patient should not. And then if someone, they will actually say if you're on immunosuppressive medication, you should stay away from this type of medicine or vaccine. So it depends on the uh, it depends on the kind of thyroid problem you have. If you have a uh, hypothyroid because you had the thyroid surgery before, probably not. But but if you have a thyroiditis, you know, which is also an autoimmune disease, then maybe when you're receiving also steroids, you're also controlling the thyroiditis. So you may actually make your thyroid function a little bit better. So it depends on what kind of thyroid problem you have. So it's methotrexy has been used in myasthenia usually for patients who fail other immunosuppressant. Um, you can have, you know, methotrexy comes in an injection, which is typically what uh, it has been used in rheumatoid arthritis. It's been approved medication for rheumatoid arthritis. And I think the, the trial that Dr. Pascuzzi uh, talked to your friend about is the the trial that they're actually using oral medication of methotrexate for uh, refractory myasthenia patients. Um, like I mentioned in my talk that so far, uh, it's been found to be well tolerated. And some of the side effects that you do need to monitor liver function when, when someone's receiving methotrexate and and uh, you make sure that you have to have a PPD test, make sure that it's, you don't have TB or latent TB tuberculosis before you start the medicine. Myasthenia gravis that is autoimmune, what you inherit is usually genetic predisposition, not the myasthenia itself, meaning you have a genetic predisposition to develop different autoimmune diseases. Now, you can have the congenital myasthenic syndromes in children that can look like myasthenia, that it's due to particular genetic alteration in one of the proteins that I mentioned, then those are the ones that can be in inherited, okay? So autoimmune myasthenia gravis itself it's, it's used most commonly what we call sporadic. Now, there are few cases of uh, familial myasthenia gravis. In, in other words, more than one member in your family with the autoimmune type or the myasthenia gravis type. But in general, it's not the condition that you said you have it, therefore your, your, your children, two out of four, is going to get it. Okay? It's a congenital myasthenic syndromes that the ones that uh, more, uh, more known to be, can be inherit, inherited. I 
In some patients may present um, years and years after they've started having the symptom for, for whatever reason, uh, no, having no access to the medical doctors or you know, the diagnosis can be delayed uh, for many years. But we know there are two group of patients who tend to have mycenia. One is the younger patients, and in that, that group is the younger, the female patients. And then um, there's a group of patients that are elderly, and, and that patients tend to be more male predominant. So if you, you, you probably fall into the second group of patients. So I think probably wouldn't, that's a late, uh, late onset of mycenia, so probably wouldn't affect when you were younger. It's, if it's medication-induced steroid, right. I have had patients who their diabetes gone once steroids stopped or even reduce to a minimum amount. Of course, that doesn't mean that you, know, you have to eat whatever you want. You can eat whatever you want. And, you know, still a healthy lifestyle is required. So in terms of a question earlier about nutrition and, and, and my senior, that's one area we're in. And for somebody on steroids, you have to watch your diet. Uh, in other words, it doesn't have to be necessarily, uh, you know, you just have to make sure that uh, you cut down on the carbohydrates in your diet. And uh, uh, in order not to stimulate, you know, steroid can induce your, it can increase your appetite, right? So you have to avoid sweets because sweets usually stimulate your appetite. So unfortunately, you have to make your diet a little bit more blunt, higher protein, lower carbohydrate. And that can sometimes uh, lessen the, the, the amount of weight you gain from steroids. Yeah, um, if you're planning to have a child, make sure you let your doctor know so the doctor can plan ahead of what medication that you will take. Um, certain medications, the literature and the amount of evidence we have tell us that it's safe to use during pregnancy and those medications are steroid and um, uh, pyridostigmine mestinon. Um, Treatments such as plasma exchange or plasmapheresis and IVIG are also believed to be safe during pregnancy, especially pregnant women undergoing um, MG crisis. Um, in, now, I know in Europe, the practice is a little bit different. Imuran is used in pregnant women, but in the United States, it's still listed as um, uh, contraindicated in pregnant women, as well as uh, Michael uh, Celsept or Michael Phenolate and the other immunosuppressant that I mentioned. In, in addition to this contraindication are not absolute in the sense that the patient really needs it, you know, because your myasthenia really uh, is fluctuating without this medication, then you, you just have to weigh the benefits versus the, 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 the potential risk. Uh, one thing is you have to let your doctor know about the myasthenia for two reasons, uh, if you're getting pregnant because your baby can have a transient neonatal myasthenia during the first few weeks of life, okay? Uh, so, uh, the, so even though it's a temporary condition, that, you know, at least you have to discuss this. And there's a small risk that the baby, uh, uh, if there's a certain type of antibodies that are present in the patient, it may uh, have uh, a small chance of uh, fetal abnormality. Um, and so that's why you have to discuss this with your myasthenia doctor if you want to get pregnant. Most of the patients don't knock on wood. They have gone through the pregnancy okay, no problem. Mild transient neonatal myasthenia for the baby. And, uh, and also during labor, your, your OB doctor will have to talk to your myasthenia doctor also. Um, because if, especially if your myasthenia is not in remission and you're gonna be tiring out during labor, uh, so those are, so that's why those, you have to discuss first before you plan your pregnancy. I will use the safest drug possible uh, to minimize the adverse effect on the fetus. So those would be um, pyridostigmine. If, if that's not enough to control the symptom, then uh, steroid. And, you know, plasma exchange, IVIG, depends on the severity of the symptom.
Neck pain may or may not be symptoms of MG because some patients may, if, they, if you have neck muscle weakness, you know, that you feel tired when you're holding your head, they can explain, uh, they can have some uh, soreness on just from trying to hold your head up. But if you don't have problem with your, you know, any problem with double vision, chewing, swallowing, or neck muscle, it's just arm weakness, that may be from something different, you know, uh, like pinched nerve in the neck, you know, so your doctor will have to do the workup and see whether that's related to myasthenia or not. 